I want to talk to you today about why I believe women are going to power the economy in the 21st century. Uh, but I really have to start and take you back to the last year of the last century, 1999. And that was when I was chairing the National Women's Business Council, appointed by President Clinton, to really measure the results of women-led businesses, and especially those that had procurement with the federal government. Well, that's a very nice thing, nice appointment, but it just was not big enough for me. I really wanted to create something where it would have an impact for women. And I started looking around, and I saw all this money pouring over the transom in the late 90s. Over $100 billion in venture capital, and only 1.7% was going to women. And I said, somebody has to do something about this. Well, Amy Millman, who is uh, the director of the National Women's Business Council, and I headed off to Silicon Valley because that's where the money is. And we said, let's try to find some women in technology and life sciences and high growth companies that people will want to fund and see what happens. So we came to Silicon Valley. And uh, we had a little kitchen cabinet of friends who were co-founders with us. And Denise Berceau is sitting here in the audience. And she's one of them, Denise. And uh, she can share this story, too. Um, so we got together 57 women who had something to do with venture capital at a friend's house, at Heidi Rosen's house. And uh, it was very interesting. Uh, 36 showed up. Half of them said, this is a great idea. We're going to support you. And the other half said, don't you dare. You're not going to find good enough companies. I thought it was very interesting. But nonetheless, undeterred, we said we are going forward. So we made a call out for applications for people who were in these type of technology and life science companies. And we are hoping to get 100 uh, so we could maybe present 10 companies. Um, and a week before the applications were due, 50 applications. And I thought, oh, maybe those people were right. They said we wouldn't find enough good companies. The day arrived, 350 applications. And we were like, wow, and they came in on paper. And, uh, and we said, paper, remember paper? Um, and uh, we said, luckily, the students from Berkeley and uh, Stanford in the MBA program helped us to sift and winnow through to find the best companies. And we chose 26 companies to present. And they did on January 27, 2000. Now, we gathered together at the Oracle Conference Center to present these companies. And the only thing that was different from any other venture forum, where the venture capitalists sit in the audience and listen to the presenters, was all of the presenters were women. And that had never happened before. So then what happened? 22 of those companies got funded. Two of them merged their business. One sold her business, and one wasn't funded. And we have never looked back. But so what has Springboard done since 2000 with the companies? And this is the companies' results, the companies we represent. We've seen over 4,000, near, nearly 5,000 now companies. We've chosen 537 companies to work with, to train and present to venture capitalists and others to raise money. Collectively, these companies have raised $6.2 billion and growing. Uh, one third of them have had positive liquidity events, meaning they have made money for their investors. They were sold or they went IPO, including 10 IPOs. You know some of them, iRobot, Zipcar, Constant Contact, Xenogen, Icazin, Viacel. There are a lot of biotech companies in the group. It's an amazing story. Uh, of really the ability of women to grow and scale large businesses. And, but women have to have the funding to also do that. So the numbers are spectacular. But who are these people? They're the most interesting thing. They're the people, the entrepreneurs that we're really so excited about. And this is what makes me excited every single day to meet more of them. Robin Chase presented Zip Zipcar case in 2000. It was the first car sharing club in the United States, somewhere between owning a car and renting a car. Uh, and you belonged to the club, and you uh, got to pick up a car in a local garage where they're parked throughout urban areas. I'm a zip car user in New York City. Um, and you really uh, just, it's like owning the car, really. You just sign up on the web. It takes less than a minute to pick up the nearest car. You go over, put in your card, your membership card, opens the door, you drive away. You have obligations. You have to bring the car back when you said you're going to bring it back. 
It has to have a quarter of a tank of gas, and it has to be clean. And she built this company without a penny of marketing because it was a culture that she built. An amazing woman, a thought leader, and this is important, a thought leader in transportation today, named by Time Inc. as one of the 100 most influential people of 2009. Who else is in our group? Linda Hall. I knew the moment I saw Linda Hall present in 2003, Minute Clinic. It was based on one hour photo, actually, where she was thinking people could go into a pharmacy, into a big box provider, and take a child with strep throat or earache or infection or something simple to diagnose in a kiosk that was set up inside, manned by a practitioner nurse. And her innovation was to be able to read the diagnosis electronically and return it within 15 minutes, get the, far, get the uh, prescription, go right to the pharmac pharmacist in the building, get it filled, and you can get out the door in 30 minutes, and that was really a fantastic. She was a leader in urgent care healthcare. Um, these are amazing women. The next one, Ping Fu. If you, if you want to ever be inspired, read the book, Bend, Not Break, by Ping Fu. This is a woman born in China. At the age of eight, she was taken from her family during the Cultural Revolution in charge of her four-year-old sister separated from her family, went to a work camp, was not allowed to learn anything. They had no education. And when she got out after the end of the Cultural Revolution, she was self-taught, went to a university, got graduated, was a journalist, and was writing stories about the communist government that they didn't like. They expelled her from the country. Luckily for her, she landed in the United States, not speaking a word of English, by the way, and went to college, got a degree in computer science. Actually was uh, the professor of Mark, of Mark Andreessen when he was doing Mosaic, so it's kind of interesting. A leader in 3D technology, one of the leading changes coming to the manufacturing world today. Uh, she is an amazing woman. She's also on the, advisor, the National Advisory Committee for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. These are the kind of people that, you know, many stories, big and small, that really inspire me every day. And here is an interesting story. A mother and daughter team with a needless injector, those who travel around the world and especially working in developing nations know what a problem reuse of needles is in spreading HIV and other serious diseases. But let's hear their story from them. Kathleen Callender, the founder of Pharmajet. I'm Heather Callender Potters and our project is needle-free technology. My husband and I have done medical group missions in the developing world, and I've been in healthcare all my life. Globally, uh, there's a huge problem with used needles in the world. 40 to 70% of the needles are reused or used in an unsafe manner, and people get stuck all the time with dirty needles. The consequences are the transmission of hepatitis B and C and AIDS, HIV. And along with that comes 20 other blood-borne pathogen diseases. There's about 1.7 billion injections given annually for vaccines. And that's really about 10% of the therapeutics market, which is much larger. We realized that there is a better way. I said, I've got to do this. I don't know how to do it, but I know how to learn. Other people had tried to create needle-free technology with a spring technology or small CO2 cartridges. And I decided that if I found people smarter than myself to help me, that I could do it. We started by asking for help, and help meaning going to the largest NGOs of the world, people who could have empathy with what we were doing, but also find utility. So we could provide the device, they could sometimes provide market access. We're working on the next generation of what our technology can do, which is to potentially cut the dose of vaccine by 80%. To be able to feel like we can make a contribution to disease eradication is really invigorating. Amazing women, and uh, if you heard that last part, cutting the cost of vaccines by 80%, preventing disease, amazing women. I wish I could tell you the story of all 537 that we've worked with so far, but let me tell you something that's getting more support out there too for women. Mutar Kent, the CEO of Coca-Cola Company, 
was asked when he was giving a lecture at Yale University in 2010, what is your next big market for Coca-Cola? Would it be, they were thinking the BRIC countries. Was it going to be Brazil or Russia or India or China? And he said, well, it's not going to be any of those. It's going to be women. Now, we know that women do 66% of the world's work, earn 10% of the world's income, and put 90% of that back into their communities. And this is what's really important. So what did Coca-Cola do to follow up on that statement? Very interesting. They began to work for solar power and water distillers and put them into remote villages, rural villages in Africa and India, and, to, and put women in business. So they have chosen women as their distributors, if you will, of solar power, clean water, and energy for charging cell phones and lanterns, things like that. And they have a, 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 compet a, a, a commitment to have five million of those women in business by the year 2020. And here is one of them. Here she has her solar power, she has her water distiller, She's telling you that she can charge. She's the new entrepreneur in her community. She's so delighted to do that. And when you think about five million of these women throughout rural villages around the world, there are the new, and Coca-Cola isn't doing this just to be altruistic, I must think. They also think these women are going to be the distributors of Coca-Cola products. So isn't that a fantastic build? But it's not the only thing that is going on. And we've heard many wonderful stories here today already. One of them is, is a friend of mine, Nadu Adwani, who is creating videos for, uh, health videos for women in India pre and post natal in, natal in rural villages. And this communication is really an important communications tool for, for women uh, because as we've heard from other speakers here today, it's really important to get these early messages to women for better health care for their villagers, for their children, for their families, they all reinvest in that. And um, he's delivering a very important message, which I would like to show you now. Yes, they're singing about breastfeeding and the importance of breastfeeding. So we heard earlier about singing about solar power. So yeah, it's really important to have the communications tools to get the message out across to people. One thing I am very sure of, we as women are going to power the economy of the 21st century. We're going to power empower a billion women around the globe. And I'm very confident from the people I'm hearing here today and I hear every day, women, we have the power. We can do it. We can raise the capital. We can deploy the right people. And we're going to do it with compassion. Thank you all for joining this revolution.